Hello, we're going to talk about alcohol, how it relates to somebody who uses insulin or certain medications for treating type 2 diabetes, and the risk for low blood sugar. So the objectives of this module are to understand how alcohol can lead to hypoglycemia and to name three tips for reducing that risk in patients who use insulin and to know the suggested limits for how much women and men should be drinking as a limit per day and what counts as one drink. People who take insulin, all types, are at risk for hypoglycemia if they drink. That risk is also for people who take oral agents that stimulate insulin production, such as sulfonylureas, glyburide, glipizide, amaryl. This slide will explain how alcohol impairs gluconeogenesis. In orange is the relative glucose concentration, both after eating and then between meals. So for the first four hours, you usually have glucose available from the meal that you ate. The highest blood sugar is one to two hours after the meal. By about the fourth hour, you're done digesting your food. Then you switch to glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis, and glucose is being supplied from the liver to keep the person's blood sugar stable. Imagine drinking alcohol on an empty stomach. Alcohol is processed in the liver. Ethanol is converted to acetaldehyde by alcohol dehydrogenase. During that time, NAD is reduced to NADH. Acetaldehyde is the toxic uh, insult to the brain and to the hepatocytes, so the body wants to process that further to CO2. But my point here is that when alcohol is being processed in the liver, it takes priority and the liver is unable to continue to release enough glucose. Because NADH has to be disposed of, and that will block other path pathways that need NAD. So in the long run, what that means is that you synthesize more lipids and triglycerides can go up from drinking alcohol. It also impairs gluconeogenesis because you need available NAD to do gluconeogenesis. So exogenously administered insulin will continue to push blood glucose down despite falling serum glucose levels. You can't take that insulin out once it's in. Now if you had a person who did not have diabetes, whose pancreas was making the right amount of insulin, that pancreas would turn on production and off production as needed in very distinct short little bursts and the person would not get a low blood glucose. Blood glucose drops because of the insulin that's on board in somebody who's injecting insulin. It would be the long-acting insulins or it'd be the basal rates in the pump. What about carbs and alcohol? So many people think, oh, alcohol is going to raise my blood glucose level. There's absolutely no carbohydrate in the hard alcohols like gin, vodka, whiskey, scotch, bourbon. Not even wine. Juice, fruit juice, is converted to alcohol when you ferment it. There's no carb residual less than one gram. A beer, because it does have barley and malt and hops, has about 13 grams of carb, give or take, in a 12 ounce beer. A light beer might only have five grams of carb. But a mixed drink can have significant amounts of carbohydrate, you know, especially if you see fruit and a little umbrella on top, it's probably got quite a bit of juice or something, margaritas, daiquiris, all of those things can have carbohydrate. So what are the limits? If an adult with diabetes chooses to drink alcohol, the American Diabetes Association suggests that women not have more than one drink a day and men not more than two. So what counts as a drink? It's a 12 ounce bottle of beer, not a big red kegger cup. It's five ounces of wine, not an eight ounce goblet. And it's one and a half ounces, which is a shot glass of hard alcohol. Each one of those is an alcohol equivalent. The only one there that I mentioned that has carbohydrate is the beer, has a little bit. Don't drink on an empty stomach. You want to have some form of carbohydrate if you're having alcohol. So it's much safer to have that glass of wine with your pasta, to have that beer with your pizza. If it's a before dinner cocktail, then look for crackers or something to have with it. But when do people actually drink? The older generation, it's the pre-dinner cocktail. It might be the martini. It might be sipping on wine while making dinner. What if lunch was five or six hours ago? 
there's no carbohydrate left from lunch. If you're drinking in that time zone, you're using only the glycogen and gluconeogenesis from the liver. And the minute you start drinking and your liver is processing that alcohol, you're impairing the release of glucose from the liver and you're at risk for low. What about the younger generation? When do they drink? When does the college age student drink? It's late at night, after school, after studies, after everything's done. Parties, clubs, nightclubs, all of those times are late at night. And how much do they consume? The more they consume, the bigger the risk. How many hours has it been since dinner? How many drinks have they had? How many hours will gluconeogenesis be impaired? Generally, one drink impairs you for at least two hours. So if somebody has three beers, two, four, six hours or more, their liver's impaired at releasing glucose. That's a significant amount of time that you can be low. What if you're stumbling because you are low and somebody just saw you with a cocktail? Are they gonna come to your assistance or do they think you're intoxicated? What happens during sleep when you've had three or four beers earlier in the evening and now it's 3 a.m. and the alcohol is still in your liver impairing gluconeogenesis. Do you feel your lows when you're asleep? Not necessarily. So there is a risk of significant severe lows and even you can die from low blood sugar after heavy drinking. So what about glucagon? Glucagon is a hormone. People that inject insulin should have a glucagon kit. And when administered, somebody else would give it to them because they're passed out or having a seizure or something. When administered, the way that it works is the glucagon tells the liver to do gluconeogenesis, glycogenolysis. Glucagon injection isn't gonna work as well if the liver's busy with alcohol. The liver may have stored glycogen and it can still release stored glycogen when the liver is dealing with alcohol. It's the gluconeogenesis that it can't do. Recovery from a severe low blood glucose, in other words, is greatly impaired. So drink responsibly. That means limiting alcohol consumption. Don't drink on an empty stomach ever if you're an insulin user. Carry a meter and quick acting carbs to treat lows. Don't be unprepared. Educate family and friends and the people that you're with on how to recognize if you're having a low blood glucose and what to do, calling 911 for example. It's important to keep carbohydrate bedside and set an alarm if you find that, okay, I did drink more than I know I should have. Let's set an alarm and wake up, set it on loud and see what your blood sugar is doing. Don't sleep through severe hypoglycemias. Don't ever drive after drinking and being on insulin, of course, after drinking at all. Um, and it's very important to have a medical alert bracelet, somebody who's down and out and unconscious from a low blood sugar um, who's been seen drinking could look like somebody who's just intoxicated and passed out. That concludes all of my modules on managing diabetes and I hope that the carb counting or the carb portioning makes sense and how important it is for people with diabetes to understand the adjustments necessary for exercise and the precautions around alcohol and how to prevent and treat hypoglycemia. As you can see, diabetes is a very complex disease and it can be very overwhelming and it really does take a multidisciplinary approach. So it's the person who has diabetes who ultimately is their own diabetes manager and it's the providers that help guide and give information that can help that person uh, learn how to self-manage. The amount of time we spend with them in a year is pretty minute. It's their day-to-day -day knowledge of managing that will help them in the future. So it's important to involve dietitians, nurses, pharmacists, and everybody in educating the person with diabetes, whether that's through one-on-one -on -one consultations or through diabetes management education classes. Uh, there are many approaches.